Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome you to the Anlinger Highlight Seminar, which is co-sponsored today by the Center for Policy Research on Energy and the Environment, uh, which is part of uh, the School of uh, International and Public Affairs. Uh, our speaker today is Rob Lampert. Let me introduce Rob. Uh, Rob Lampert is a principal researcher at the RAND Corporation and director of the Rand Frederick as party center for longer range global policy and the future of human condition. Rob's research focuses on risk management and decision making under conditions of deep uncertainty. Dr. Lampert is a convening lead author for working group two of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, six assessment report, uh, was a, a chapter lead for the fourth US national climate assessment and is a member of Harvard's COPEX uh, Geoengineering Advisory pa Panel, as well as a member of California's Climate Safe Infrastructure Working Group. Dr. Lampert is the inaugural president of the Society for Decision Making Under Deep Uncertainty, a fellow of the American Physical Society, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, it was also the inaugural EADS Distinguished Visitor in Energy and Environment at the American Academy in Berlin. A professor of policy analysis in the Party Rand Graduate School, Dr. Lampert is co-author of the book Shaping the Next 100 Years, New Methods in Quantitative Longer-Term Policy Analysis. On a more personal and local note, Rob is also the brother of Liz Lampert, the mayor of the town of Princeton, who I believe is listening to us. Today, Rob will be talking to us about climate change and deep uncertainty. Can we manage the risks without knowing what they are? Take it away, Rob. Okay, thank you, Elke, and um, uh, thanks so much for having me here. And uh, hello, everybody. Um, uh, good to uh, be with you all, all virtually. So um, um, I am going to uh, be talking about uh, climate change risk management, uh, addressing the challenges of climate change under these conditions of, of deep uncertainty, which I'll talk about. And um, I need to share my slides. Here we go. There we go. Um, and um, uh, in essence, the, the answer to the question we pose here, can we manage the risks without knowing what they are, is yes. And I'm going to try to uh, set up that question and show you how we get to yes. So um, uh, addressing climate change requires ambitious action, um, both on, on, in decarbonization and adapting to the impacts of climate change. I show here on the on the left, um, a, uh, a graph from the recent IPCC Global Warming of 1.5 Degrees report, which just gives a sense of um, to, to meet the, the various goals of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the Paris Agreement, how fast emissions have to, to come down, which is the, essentially the, um, the, the gray line, and then even the extent to which we have to learn how to do things we currently don't know how to do and do them at scale, such as uh, sucking carbon out of the atmosphere to meet some of these goals. On the right, um, is just one picture of uh, the challenges of adapting to climate change and the, 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 the large changes they, they suggest. Um, this is um, a, uh, a developer's um, uh, concept of, of a project at Treasure Island in the middle of San, San Francisco Bay, which essentially is, is meant to be more resilient to sea level rise by putting the people in the buildings at the center in, in high rises and having vast spaces of open space around, which if the seas rise uh, can uh, fill up those areas. So it's basically we have to redesign our cities, our infrastructure, both to deal with the impacts of climate change and, um, uh, and to reduce emissions. And this all goes on in a fast changing world. This is, these are just graphs that show how, how much our world has changed since um, uh, over the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, it was about six times the population, 10 times uh, GDP, uh, vast urbanization, and then the little, uh, 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 autonomous vehicle car just to suggest also have has technologies changing. So the world is changing in many ways and we need to make big changes to address climate change. Um, climate plans are often organized around very ambitious goals. Um, uh, and so that organizations, nation states, private sector firms uh, at the international level, national level, uh, set these uh, ambitious goals for mitigation and to some extent for adaptation and then uh, try to put in place plans that get us get us to those goals. Uh, th this goal-based um, uh, management uh, is, 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 is important. Goals are really important. They can help encourage proactive action. They can 
help coordinate action by uh, a, a, a multiplicity of largely independent actors, provide benchmarks for measuring progress. Um, how do we think about evaluating such plans, evaluating the goals, particularly when the changes we envision are so large? A um, lot of ways one can frame that. I, I, I just grabbed this uh, wonderful phrase that comes out of a, uh, uh, an Ezra Klein podcast with uh, Jane Flegel, uh, where they talk about the boundary between ambition and delusion. Um, risk management has increasingly been used in the climate world as a way of framing uh, the problem. Um, it can be a very powerful framework. I uh, show on the left here the latest incarnation of the IPCC uh, so-called propeller diagram. Uh, where risk um, is a function of, of hazard, the, uh, the occurrence, potential occurrence of a, of a climate event, uh, exposure, the extent to which things we care about, people, uh, lively, uh, our buildings, infrastructure are exposed to such events, vulnerability to the extent to such events uh, can cause harm. And the new addition is uh, the response that as we respond to climate risks, either by uh, uh, aggressive moves to reduce emissions or change the way that where our city, how are they're built and where they're located, those actions can also generate a uh, risk. Um, on the right, I've got um, uh, the uh, iterative risk management uh, process where there's a process of scoping, analysis, implementation. Uh, the analysis is where we identify risks and options to address them. And this iterative process is meant to continue uh, because it's, um, the risks are constantly changing and evolving. Risk is a really useful framework because it helps us link scientific and technical assessments to consequences that we care about. It helps us characterize the uncertainty, helps link this assessment to uh, solutions, and helps uh, identify and communicate trade-offs and choices. But there's a lot of criticism of the risk framework as well. People uh, crit critique it for um, uh, being technocratic, by being expert-driven, and having a tendency sometimes to um, uh, underplay or underestimate um, uh, the, the challenges that we actually face. Um, the sort of counter or another framing, um, which perhaps complicates the, uh, the risk framing is climate change as a complex and a wicked problem. Um, oh, Hort, Hortel and, and Weber, uh, uh, many decades ago, planners um, uh, famously posed the par paradox that the more analysts like us, uh, uh, the more skilled we get at understanding a problem, often the less the public believes us. They uh, uh, contrast the tame and wicked problems. A tame problem is where everybody agrees on the object objective and what the problem is. Um, and therefore you can turn to the experts to solve it. And a wicked problem, which has the characteristics uh, list here, not well-bounded, different people see the problem very differently, huge uncertainties, uh, non-linear complex dynamics, and you really don't have an agreement on what the problem is until you have come to a solution. Uh, part of uh, wicked problems is this notion of complexity. Uh, here, uh, uh, lay out the, the Kinefin uh, framework for thinking about comparing complex, simple, and complicated systems. Um, much of our analytics, much risk management sees systems as complicated, uh, but complex ones are, are actually quite different. The behavior of complex systems can be understood, but uh, may be difficult to predict. And instead of managing in a sense of analyzing them under predicting how they're gonna act and then responding based on those predictions, complex systems require different ways of management. So what I wanna talk about today is how one can expand, reconcile, use the risk framework in these conditions of deep uncertainty, complexity, uh, these wicked problems uh, that, that, that uh, we face with climate change uh, using a set of methods called decision-making under deep uncertainty. Um, here's a sort of the, the, the contrast that traditional risk management are designed for systems, single relevant decision-maker, well-understood behavior, agreement on objectives, uh, climate risk management requires methods and tools that embrace a diversity of priorities and goals and values, have this deep or irreducible uncertainty, and often have multiple uh, decision makers. 
And uh, this is a growing field. This decision making under deep uncertainty has a whole variety of, of flavors and approaches. I'm going to talk about uh, one common one, which which I've been most involved with, called robust decision making. But the the comments I, I give here are really uh, I'm going to bleed into some of the other methods, and I think apply more broadly. So. I'm going to talk about this robust decision making idea. I'm going to take you through three sets of um, uh, themes uh, having to do with looking at climate plans, stress tests, uh, turning those stress tests into adaptive strategies, and how then this supports participation and deliberation, and then close with a couple of observations. Okay, so traditional risk management. Um, begins with a consensus understanding of the future. And so we begin by saying, what will future conditions be? And in simple cases, where there's just a forecast and more complicated ones or, or more thorough uh, analyses will have a joint probability distribution over future states of the world. We take that understanding of future conditions and then we can rank uh, different decision options. Uh, you know, from, from, from best, to best to worst. And then we might do some sensitivity analysis to uh, see how sensitive our ranking is to our various assumptions. And so um, this embodies a very rich set of methods, uh, but generally they go under, we can put them under the category predict. That was, we're gonna get a consensus understanding of what the future might hold and the uncertainty in those predictions. And then we can act based on those um, uh, predictions. Um, this is a powerful set of methods. Um, you know, I always say that you wouldn't get on an airplane where people don't do this very well, but when uncertainties are deep, it can break down. Uh, these predictions can turn into tunnel vision. And in particular, there's great pressures to underestimate the uncertainty because if you embrace the full set of uncertainty, then it uh, becomes very difficult to rank your policies. And so the, the whole process breaks down. Compe uh, conversely, competing analyses can contribute to gridlock. If uh, a policy is predicated on a prediction, if people don't like the prediction, uh, don't like the policy, they can attack the prediction, uh, which is often has, uh, uh, is more vulnerable than the policy itself. And this idea that we know a lot about um, uh, about a problem that can use to distinguish different policies, even if that information is not very predictive. And so this concept of deep uncertainty is when the parties to a decision do not know or do not agree on the likelihood of alternative futures or how actions are related to consequences. So this, this uh, and there's whole taxonomies of levels of uncertainty, but essentially this, we characterize, we compare this to the well-characterized uncertainty where you have a, um, uh, an agreed upon set of probability distributions that characterize sort of traditional risk analysis. So RDM and other DMDU methods follow an alter alternative approach for, for using our analytics. So instead of predict the NAC, we essentially run the analysis backwards. And so we start with a, a proposed strategy or decision, uh, one or more, uh, start with, and you'll see we start with the sorts of climate plans we, we mentioned earlier. We use in our analytics to ask a different set of questions. And the first key question is, what are the conditions where this strategy or strategies meets or misses goals or the conditions where say strategy A is better than strategy B and vice versa. And once we've understood those sorts of questions, which are often more high confidence, we can answer those with more confidence than a question of how likely is this future versus that future, we can, um, identify new and revised strategies that are perhaps more robust over a range of futures. So essentially RDM pulls together four key concepts. One is classic ideas, decision and risk analysis, structured frameworks, ways to, to adjudicate or understand trade-offs, but often these methods are very prescriptive. They give rankings, this is better than that. Um, it also draws on scenario ideas, the ideas of scenario planning, which embrace the idea of multiple worldviews, discuss plausibility, not probability, which is a way to bring people who have different views of what's most likely, or more often have different views of what the best policy action is, which are then correlated with uh, views of what's more likely, and are often, as opposed to being prescriptive, meant in deliberative uh, situations. Um, 
Then the idea of stress testing, which um, comes out of a whole variety of planning literature. Uh, we talk about stress tests in, in financial world and engineering world, which is essentially you've got a plan or you've got a thing and then you try to understand how hard can we press on it? How hard, how wide, uh, how, how, how far can our assumptions stray before the plan breaks? And finally, this idea of exploratory modeling, which is using our analytics in different ways. And just to expand out on that a little bit, RDM uses models as exploratory, but not predictive tools. And this comes out of uh, the work of a colleague, a uh, RAND colleague of mine from a number of years ago, Steve Bankus, who distinguished between consolidative models and exploratory models. Consolidative models gather all the relevant information to a single package, uh, are basically meant to be a, a you know, single representation or model of the world. They can be validated, they can be used for prediction. Much of science, much of engineering uses models like that. But really there's a whole different class of models which we use our models and data map assumptions onto consequences without privileging one set of assumptions. And these models can be used to support iterative problem solving. In particular, we can generate hypotheses, we can identify special cases, and we can find common properties across wide ranges of assumptions. And one example of that is this idea of robust strategy. In particular, we're gonna be using the second and third items on this list in the discussion today. And RDM then integrates these four concepts into this iterative decision analytic process. I showed you this uh, little flow chart before. Essentially the middle part is stress tests, which give us scenarios. And then we can do our decision analytics based on the stress tests and scenarios. And this, this whole iterative process is meant to be an inductive reasoning process with exploratory models. Okay, so let me dive into some examples to illustrate uh, the point. So I'm gonna start out with stress tests of decarbonization climate action plans. So the first one I'm gonna show you is from a, um, uh, from a, 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 the Sacramento Council of Governments. This is a metropolitan planning organization, which is responsible for uh, uh, convening and coming, uh, the communities and coming up with a uh, transportation a mobility plan, uh, a 20 year planning document, um, this is the MPO for the Sacramento region in, in Northern California. Um, they have mobility and equity goals, and they also have to meet California's stringent greenhouse gas requirements. And so in 2016, they put together their regional transportation plan in this document. And it essentially uses, there's a whole mix of different policies, but essentially more compact land use and transportation investments meet their improved mobility and equity while significantly reducing emission reductions. We, this plan was very state of the art, but basically built on a, a very uh, simple three scenario analysis and uh, very limited actually in the number of, of assumptions that it explores. So we worked with them and put this into an RDM context to do a more complete stress test of the plan to both look for vulnerabilities and things they could do to lessen those vulnerabilities. So just to take you through this, um, to give you a sketch, a gestalt here of how this works, is we, we have their planning models and we run them over many, many plausible futures which explore all sorts of different combinations of internal and external uh, uncertainties, factors, trends that, that might affect the, their ability to um, exceed or, or, or fall short of their plans. And so this is a two-dimensional slice looking at um, uh, mobility, um, a measure of mobility in the region in 2035 and their total greenhouse gas reductions. And there's a couple of other dimensions, which I'm not showing here, but a, each dot is their plan in a particular future, particular combination of assumptions. A gray dot means that they missed some or all of their goals. And a green dot means they missed, uh, they met their goals and you, all of their goals. And you can see basically They've got a mobility goal, so the mobility has to be high and they have an emissions goal and so emissions have to be low, which is why the green dots cluster in the, the lower right corner there. So um, that gives us a little bit of information, but we'd like to know more. And so a classic thing we do um, in these analysis is called scenario discovery, where the dots on the left are a big database and we run analytics 
uh, classification algorithm analytics against it and ask the question, tell me what is the best descriptor, the best set of conditions that distinguish uh, the, those features where that my agency meets and misses its goals. And the answer is on the right. So here are a whole bunch of uncertainties ranging from electric vehicle penetration to how driving behaviors of millennials, what happens with gas prices, fuel efficiency, economic growth, and how driving, how sensitive driving is to economic growth and to the cost of driving. And it turns out that some of these uncertainties matters, others don't. Um, and um, uh, the green bars show that if you, if the future is uh, contained within the range of each of those green bars, then SACOG is likely to meet its decarbonization, mobility, and equity goals. If it's outside, you miss it. And then the little um, uh, vertical uh, lines show the planning assumptions they used in their, in their 2016 plan, which in some cases are right in the middle of the bars, some cases right at the end. But what you overall see is that they are very sensitive uh, to a whole variety of external factors that they did not consider, uh, not explore over when they made their plan. And so then we took this result and then worked with them to come up with some hedges, some ways that they can reduce their vulnerability to these plan, uh, to these uh, uncertainties. We do the same thing in a whole variety of contexts. This is some work uh, by um, some colleagues of mine at RAND and then the Inter-American Development Bank where they worked with the, uh, the, the government of Costa Rica, ran a big stakeholder process for the country um, on their national decarbonization plan, explored a whole bunch of policies and uncertainties, um, and then stress tested their plan over a whole wide range of futures. And what they found is that in general, um, the Costa Rica decarbonization plan would uh, meet its aggressive emission reduction decarbonization goals by 2050, at the same time generating economic benefits. But there were a variety of ways in which the plan could go wrong. So the scatter plot on the left, the green dots give you both um, emission reductions and economic benefits. Uh, then the, the orange, uh, yellow, and red dots are various ways you can miss, miss one or both goals. And then on the right is one of these scenario discovery results where it shows a particular way in the transportation sector where um, uh, the, the plan could go awry, which is essentially one with lots of economic growth and uh, broken assumptions uh, on the part of um, uh, the, the rate, the, the cost of essentially electric vehicles. So again, uh, this lets you understand where your plan can go awry and then points you to ways to fix it. Let me turn now to this adaptive strategy idea, which is one a very important way of responding to the vulnerabilities that come out and, and opportunities that come out of the stress test. So let me give you a definition of a robust strategy, which is one that uh, performs well over a wide range of futures. It can also trade some optimal performance for less sensitivity to broken assumptions or keep options open. And these. Uh, have different mathematical formulations. Uh, uh, some, you know, appropriate for some. Each is more appropriate from so, so some problems than others. Though they often all get you to the same place. Um, so robust strategies are often adaptive in that you start with near-term actions. You monitor uh, for certain trends, certain particular signposts, and then based on uh, what, you, what what you see, you can branch and come up with a on particular contingent actions, which allows you to have a strategy which is robust over a wide range of futures. And the RDM stress tests allow you to think, understand the signposts and the particular contingent actions that you would take in uh, various situations. So there, there aren't a lot of great examples of, of this in the um, mitigation side, decarbonization side, but there's a, uh, um, some very nice examples on the adaptation side. This is a classic one. This is the design of the Thames River Barrier that protects London. And this is a whole adaptive pathway, which I won't go into in detail, but essentially it is meant to be robust over a very wide range of sea level rises from one meter to four meters. Um, and what this gives you is you see the sort of um, uh, on the left in the middle, the box is existing system and raised defenses. 
Um, this is what they've begun to build. And then they've got a whole bunch of options for things that they could do, which would protect them, the city of London up to various levels of sea level rise and various signals about when you might take each of these steps based on what you're observing in the world. So this has taken a plan, which in the past might have been a fixed set of actions that you would take at particular times going off in the future into this uh, adaptive contingency plan, which says we're going to start doing this and then we're going to observe these things. And this is how we would respond to each of these observations, helping you both convince people that you've got a, a viable plan and organizing your thinking about what you need to do now and what you can wait to do till later. <clears throat> so let me turn now how <clears throat> you take some of these ideas um, and use them to facilitate um, a, de a decision making and, uh, and enriching them in a couple of, I think, interesting and important directions. So first off, participatory processes can prove really important to climate action. They can enhance legitimacy, they can enhance le inclusion, they can bring in information um, from a variety, variety of sources that may not be readily apparent. They're actually often even also required by the Framework Convention on Climate Change, which uh, requires governments to enhance participatory, uh, citizen participatory processes. Uh, one particularly uh, interesting and important one for the, the type of situations we're talking about here is called deliberation with analysis, which is a participatory learning process where stakeholders deliberate over a problem framing. The an, an, analysts produce uh, information products that address questions raised by the framing. The stakeholders reconvene um, and their problem changing uh, framing may, uh, may change based on the information and you go through this iterative process. Um, and uh, in particular, this is very useful for this kind of, for facilitating this idea of frame reflection, looking at how the world looks from different framing, which is often use, useful for addressing these wicked problems. Um, let me just take you through a, then sort of a couple dimensions here. Climate action often engages in multiple jurisdictions. And so this is an example of, uh, of, of work by my colleague, Pat Reed and his group up at Cornell, which has done a lot of really interesting work with water agencies. This is a particular one looking, helping four water agencies in uh, North Carolina, Raleigh, Durham, um, and a couple of other cities. They were in the, initially independent because of the drought risk posed by climate change. They decide to link their systems together. This created a lot of opportunities, but also generated substantial new risks because now they're operating from four very different systems um, and coupled them together. The cities are very different sizes and had a whole variety of other different goals and situations which made them, uh, uh, you know, very, a lot of differences that made it very uh, a big challenge to actually operate this coupled system together, despite the fact the coupling system did uh, give them a lot more um, resiliency against drought. And so um, this group taking these stress tests and adaptive strategies methods put together actually a set of quite um, elaborate strategies, which involve short-term operating rules with a whole bunch of triggers. Uh, these little, uh, this is a, uh, uh, triggers based on reliability, uh, on um, financial situations, and so forth. Um, so short-term operating rules and how you operate your infrastructure, along with infrastructure investments, all laid out over time. Uh, and then looked at a whole bunch of different combinations of those and how they would look to the various agencies uh, listed here on the right. Uh, uh, rolling up into a bunch of criteria having to do with reliability uh, of the system, the number of times that they would actually have to go into drought restriction mode, and then their financial situation, and looking at how different ways of operating the system would look for each of the different agencies. And then this provided a way for the four agencies to come together and debate what common operating, how they wanted to operate this new coupled system in a way that served all their interests adequately across a very wide range of scenarios. And the social planner power index uh, basically is what looks best equally across everybody and which is a more game theoretic stable solution given the different power of the different organizations. But again, this is a way to think about multiple organizations, multiple actors dealing with multiple goals over multiple futures. Um, 
We've also done work that looks at engaging multiple worldviews. This is a more stylized example, some work we just recently did, but uh, moving beyond scenarios and seeing a worldview as a comprehensive conception of the world, correlated values, beliefs, and policy preferences. Um, our world today seems to be characterized people with, with, by groups with very different worldviews. And so we put together this, um, this example where there's a town, proposed economic development could increase pollution, enhance welfare for some current and new residents, essentially wipe out the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the livelihood of some other residents. Deep uncertainties in, include how susceptible the lake is to pollution, how pollution uh, intensive the development is, the effective alternative policies. How do we think about organizing the strategy the town to pursue since different groups see these problems very differently? We uh, embedded this in a cultural theory of risk and a variety of anthropological tools for organizing uh, this population into the different worldviews, which have different expectations about the fundamental dynamics of, uh, of how the, uh, the lake and the economy work, uh, given by these sort of classic curves about, uh, but show what, what is and is not resilient. Uh, different um, views on what are uh, legitimate means to pursue uh, ends, and then what ends are most important to the different groups. Um, we then conduct our RDM analysis separately for each worldview, go through a process of asking how each solution would look for one worldview, would look in another worldview, and then search for solutions that perform well across worldviews. Uh, we use this uh, device uh, called the utopia dystopia matrix, which seems to be actually a quite nice device for uh, engaging with, with, uh, with, with, with stakeholders on these questions. It's a utopia dystopia matrix because you have uh, strategies which emerge from worldviews and then you see how they work in each of the different worldviews and essentially a strat the strategy that comes out of a worldview works well in that worldview, gets a green. And then the question is how does it perform the other worldviews? This uh, one shows um, uh, uh, how strategies that um, are designed to be compromises over different worldviews, uh, higher, hierarchists, egalitarians, hierarchists, individualists, perform across different worldviews. We're using a regret measure here. And the point is essentially is that through an iterative process here, you start out with utopia dystopia matrices, which look really bad, and then you can converge down to ones which start uh, looking like more promising basis for comparison where people don't need to agree on very much, but they can see that the strategy would work in their worldview. And they could also see how the strategy would work if they adopted the view of other worldviews. And finally, let me just talk about action over time, um, climate change, decarbonization and adaptation, but in this case, decarbonization. Policies need to unfold over decades, but often policymakers have influence for a short period of time. Um, much of, uh, you know, risk analysis assumes a decision, you know, a pass which go for, for, for many generations without much consideration of actually how action in the near term affects the incentives on, on action in the further term. This is analysis that takes a totally different sort of window of opportunity view and looks at alternative policy architectures for, um, uh, for decarbonization and asks if you had, can put in place an architecture, but then the political process just evolves independent of any uh, of, of, of your influence, what architecture makes most sense? And so we put together an agent-based modeling formalism, uh, game theoretic formalism, kind of cynical, but which uh, looks at policy as a game theoretic uh, competition among firms and governments, uh, each trying to get the, uh, their preferred policy outcome, stress testing it over a wide range of futures. We find, actually not too surprisingly, that policy architectures which recycle revenue from carbon prices to for, from high emitting firms to low emitting firms can actually make a long and a large and sustained difference over decades. And that works in some cases and not in others. And you can do these stress tests and discover the cases in which it works. And so these such policy feedbacks work particularly well when there are big technology opportunities that might be exploited 
and that the government is um, uh, susceptible to pressure from the low emitting firms um, uh, to, um, to raise the carbon price uh, when these technology opportunities arise. So um, this gets at the sort of the, the, the temporal aspects of, of, of policymaking. And so finally, to return to this theme of um, uh, you know, how you think about amb ambition and transformation. This is work that, again, some of my colleagues did on the, with the Bureau of Reclamation on the Colorado River, uh, went through a whole large climate uh, stress test, had a whole range of uh, uh, eventually adaptive strategies that uh, respond over time to, um, uh, to, to new information. Uh, they're captured here by the dots. And there's through the, um, the stress testing, there was a, a, a set of about four, four key scenarios. I show two of them here, and which is essentially a business as usual scenario where management within the realm that the, um, the, the, the Bureau of Reclamation, the parties to the Colorado Compact, the, the, the current set of actions that they're currently taking, currently comfortable taking with. Then there's what's, what's called a transformative scenario where they would have to do things quite differently than they currently are um, and things which um, have not uh, heretofore been uh, you know, acceptable on their policy agenda. Um, and then asked uh, and laid out which, of, uh, which is the best strategy and how big is its regret as a function of the probability of these two different scenarios. And so we're basically spanning you know, the entire probabilistic space here. And then what you find is that the current management practices do work well in, in, a, in a set of futures, but you have to believe that the probability of the business as usual scenario is pretty likely above 80% in order to place all your bets there, which is essentially keep doing what you're doing and don't invest in any preparations for, for big changes. And in contrast, you have in order not for, in order for the transformative policies not to make a lot of sense, you really have to be, uh, you know, very convinced that they're not at all likely. And this sort of multi-scenario analysis, where you're making statements about probability thresholds, but not even attempting to talk about uh, the the likelihood of which which uh, uh, scenario, is, what the likelihood of the scenario is. Uh, it turns out to be very powerful in in, in deliberations and and getting people to um, uh, explore the the option space and, and come to some agreement what they need to do. So just some quick observations. Um, you know the answer. I think the answer to the question we posed at the beginning. Um, you know, can you manage the risks even when uh, you don't know what they are? Is is yes. I think these RDM and uh, DMDU approaches can help make risk management an even more powerful tool for complex and wicked climate challenges. Uh, essentially, they, they move away from a predict and act framework and allow you to think multi-scenario, multi-objective, multi-jurisdiction, um, and deal with, uh, rather than fixed plans, deal much more uh, uh, easily with, uh, with, with these adaptive plans. Um, not, not surprisingly, there's a whole range of really interesting and important challenges. Uh, you know, the prediction-based non-adaptive policies um, often required by law, uh, particularly in the, finding that in the transportation sector where actually you you know, for federal, federal law requires the, 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 the regional agencies to plan in a particular way, which may not be particularly um, appropriate for uh, the situations they now find themselves in. Uh, whole body of practice, professional practice, uh, you know, Beth uh, uh, favors it. A uh, whole lot of reasons people and organizations fear, uh, feel more comfortable uh, often with prediction-based policies. There's a big fear that acknowledging uncertainty dissuades action. Uh, fixed policies often perceived as um, locking in a transient window of opportunity. Often, you know, people are engaged in, an, in a political negotiation over a policy and the whole thought that the policy might be adapted in the future and they would have to re-engage in the negotiations is, is, uh, is something they don't relish. And it requires less or perhaps different institutional capability to do the fixed policies than the, the adapted ones. Nonetheless, I mean, I think this, all this uh, 
analytics and methods that we've discussed really embody some simple ideas. The first is really shifting the locus of understanding from or confidence away from the prediction to the um, to the to the plan or to the policy. And this is just a quote that from one of the water agencies we've worked with. Um, you know, in a public meeting, the, the, the planners and officials were asked, do you trust the climate models? Um, and they said, not necessarily, but we do have confidence in the plan, um, in our contingency plan. And so moving the locus of confidence from the predictions to the plan, and then just this classic statement. So these, in many ways, these ideas are not new at all, uh, but uh, from Francis Bacon, if we begin with certainties, we end in doubts. But if we start with the doubts, patient in them, uh, we, can, we can end in certainties. So uh, questions. Um, I see we've got, uh, okay, are you gonna moderate? I think you're still muted or? Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, now we can. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Rob, uh, for this very accessible introduction to a difficult problem, uh, how to deal with this often irreducible uncertainty and the complexity of future conditions in these important societal risks like climate change. Uh, audience members, uh, if you have questions uh, for our speaker, uh, please type them into the uh, Q&A window at the bottom of your screen. And maybe I'll start out uh, with a question of my own. Uh, for, yes. for, better, for, for better or worse, we've been taught you know, by the current global pandemic uh, how unpredictable the future can be. Have you seen any greater receptivity uh, of your ideas uh, of about robot decision, robot, robust decision making by <laughs> planners or by decision makers as a consequence of that realization that greater, greater humility is, is called for? And maybe more generally, can you say something about how to motivate and how to enable greater practical use of this important set of tools? Yeah, um, uh, the first question, yes. I mean, uh, um, you know, both the, uh, the, I think the pandemic is, is, is uh, you know, greatly highlighted. Uh, it, it, you don't have to explain so much what deep uncertainty is uh, these days. And, uh, but as, 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 as a whole range of, 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 um, of, of uh, changes, you know, uh, I, I've been doing more work in the transportation sector recently and just, you know, I mean, people, I mean, uh, the, 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 the quick storyline is like you started writing your plan and by you've hardly gotten through the first uh, couple of months of it and the transportation options laid out in front of your door of your building are, are different than they were than when they started, you know, so, so the rate of changes is, is affected people. Um, the, um, uh, I, 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 I think ultimately is, is then you need a, a, examples are powerful. So, I mean, I think there's been a lot of take up of this in the water field because there's been a lot of, lot of, um, lot of examples. Um, but um, uh, it is, um, it, it is, you know, people do, um, uh, you know, for, for both the institutional and the, and the you know, the, I think the cognitive and the um, uh, uh, constraints, I mean, um, are, are difficult. And, um, and oftentimes people are afraid of the, uh, you know, sort of the political consequences of talking about vulnerabilities of plans. So there's a lot of, I think, you know, institutional barriers. And um, uh, the, the, I mean, I think the, the best diffusion paths, um, at least that, you know, we found seem to be working through agencies that um, uh, s see their way to a um, uh, see, see opportunities and real benefits to being early adopters of this. So I think some of the transportation agencies we've worked with um, uh, want to actually engage the state regulators in a broader discussion because I think the regulations are, uh, are, are too, too fixed and narrow and they would like to engage in that discussion. So I think they see um, entering in this as, as yielding real benefits. So I think you need people who are high capacity, who are stuck for various reasons and see this as opening up opportunities for them. And that at least is one, one path for getting, getting into this. Mm -hmm. 
I have a question from uh, Shmuel Yerushalmi, and he's wondering uh, whether and how you can use the approaches of uh, robust decision making to address the trade-offs between uh, different types of risks, like reducing the risk of climate change on the other hand, on the one hand, uh, and then issues of development and social justice on the other hand. How, how do we deal with these types of trade-offs in your framework? Yeah. Um uh, one, the one, the one, the Costa Rica example. Um, I try to touch on that in in a, in a fairly uh, high level way by looking at um, uh, the um, uh, you know in, uh, greenhouse gas reductions and then uh, economic uh, benefits, uh, but on a, on a macro GDP level. Um, uh, but the basic structure of the analysis is that you have multiple objectives in the analysis, which reflect the um, the interests and needs of many stakeholders. You also saw in that lake model example, we had um, uh, six different um, uh, uh, objectives that were meant to represent uh, differing, uh, different things that were important to different measures of the population. Um, and um, you, you look for strategies that do a good job of, uh, of, of balancing and trying to um, uh, uh, you know, achieve your, your multiple objectives. And then you try to understand uh, you know, this, the, the situations where, you, where conflicts might develop between the objectives and then how you can, um, uh, uh, how, how you can soften those. Um, uh, the, uh, there, there's a group at the World Bank which uses these uh, and, and uh, the Inter-American Development Bank, but the World Bank in particular, the uh, Stefan Halgott and his group do some really interesting uh, work looking at um, you know, climate resilience, disaster management and poverty reduction using, using these tools. Um, and um, uh, you know, looking at both the trade-offs um, and, um, uh, and, and the synergies and they find actually development is a very uh, crucial um, uh, tool method for, for dealing with, with climate resilience. In other words, it often development makes you a lot more climate resilient, um, but also pioneering um, measures um, uh, of resilience and well-being that um, uh, help you identify in more detail, um, you know, how the strategies should be, um, uh, you know, um, uh, um, you know what effects the strategies are having. So, uh, if if you're measuring right, so the the the, the approach I laid out here allows you to look for you know strategies that do a good job balancing on multiple objectives. A key thing you need to do is have a measures that are getting at the the real interests that. Uh, uh, particularly equity uh, interests of, of disadvantaged populations, which, all, who, which often don't show up in the normal, say, economic and other measures that we use. Mm -hmm. The question from uh, Nick Choquette Levy, and he was very interested in the, the, the work that he had on world views yeah, and how that can make a difference. And he's wondering whether you have any good case studies uh, where the kind of tools uh, that you've been describing lead to collaborations among stakeholders with highly divergent worldviews. Um, the uh, the yeah, I mean, it depends how highly divergent. But uh, there is uh, uh, a lot of work with with water agencies, um, uh, both um, and then for um, uh, for for flood and uh, coastal and riverine flooding. Um, and um, so I can get you a list, but there's the, the World Bank group has done some interesting work in Bangladesh. Uh, we've got a lot of work in, um, uh, in, in the US, the Louisiana area, uh, California, um, Jamaica Bay in New York. Um, so um, yeah, no, there, there's, um, uh, there, there's, there's a lot of examples of, um, of, of you know, using these tools uh, in this deliberation with analysis um, uh, group. Um, they're generally, I mean, the examples have all been in places where there's a convener of some sort. So there is um, uh, uh, someone who brings people together and in sort of the negotiations language, you know, the, the cost of not being at the table can be relatively, you know, high so that, um, um, you know, so there's money on the table or, or someone ultimately is going to 
make some regulatory or large investment decision. So there's a reason to bring people to the table um, and stay there. So, um, so the examples have that in common, but with, with, with that caveat, I mean, there's a lot of examples of, 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 of working with multiple groups. Here's a technical question about machine learning. Uh, are machine learning methods used uh, in the RDM stress testing to find key differences between scenarios where the goals are met and where they aren't? Uh, or is this done for traditional statistical methods? Um, it's mostly done with uh, uh, a traditional statistical methods. Um, depends, you know, where you draw the boundary. But uh, the stuff I showed is is um, uh, largely um, CART and uh, PRIM, uh, a patient role induction method with a, sometimes some principal component analysis to, uh, to, to reduce the dimensionality before you start the, the classification algorithms. But um, there is increasingly um, uh, work on, on machine learning. Um, we've got this Society for Decision Making Under Deep Uncertainty, and we had our um, virtual annual meeting um, a couple weeks ago. Um, and there were, were two sessions on, on machine learning. Um, so it, the, the tools are starting to, to, to come, come into play. I mean, they're, they're, they're clearly really valuable here. And so there's, it, they're, they're starting to be used. Mm -hmm. Here's a question uh, from Sally Sharpless. He says, fascinating work. This kind of approach seems very well suited to a range of decision-making problems. But I wonder about the resistance it faces or could face from different stakeholders. One of the problems that climate scientists face is public resistance to trust uh, complex models. Given the mm -hmm. centrality of RDM of converting societal problems into quantitative models, do you find that communicating the trustworthiness of the approach is sometimes hampered by people's lack of trust in that model building step? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the model building step is um, um, it is a challenge both from trust and then the um, uh, the extent to which the existing models that you may have you know constrain the the option space. Yeah. So the um, um, generally um, in the convenings with uh, you know very complicated models. Um, you know, like the, uh, the, 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 the Bureau of Reclamation Colorado River example I showed you, um, the, the model is a, um, a, a legacy model. And so, you know, it's, it's, we we're taking the model that the, um, uh, that the, you know, the federal agency has used for many years. And so uh, people are familiar with it and, um, uh, um, and you know, so the so this, the the stakeholders, you know, the environmental groups, the, the 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 various state governments, the business groups. I mean, everybody has people who are familiar with the model, and then changes in the model that um, you make as a result of the stress test, and then to say look at new policies are are done in a negotiated way with with the people. So the model is essentially you know co-created with people who understand it well. Um, so um, we've dabbled some in participatory modeling techniques where you get people where they, you know, they jointly create a model. So I think there's some real promise there. Um, we're doing a project right now, which is less, um, uh, not heavily RDM, though it's got, got some flavor that um, uh, on, on landslide uh, risk in, um, uh, in, in a small Alaska town. Um, and um, so there, there's a lot of distrust is, is, is probably a fair word, more sort of, uh, yeah, well, just distrust of the models. And uh, there it's um, just a lot of um, engagement at all sorts of levels, some citizen science, so people are involved in the creation of the data sets. Um, and, um, and, uh, and then providing information you know, in a way that's, you know, very layered and transparent. But yes, no, I mean, the, um, um, uh, the you know, the, there, there, are, there are processes for, for trying to build that trust, which are largely, you know, uh, a lot of outreach and, um, and, and, um, and, uh, and, 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 you know, participation in the creation of the tools, uh, though in practice they can be, you know, obviously time consuming and hard. Mm -hmm. So Karen Shu and another uh, participant had a question about the appropriate scale uh, for DMDU tools. 
The examples you provide, uh, it's a project uh, at municipal level. Would it be possible to apply DMDU analysis to international issues where there are more complex set of interacting factors and stakeholders affecting the future at a broader scale? Yeah, I mean, people do. Um, there's some, uh, uh, you know, really interesting work um, uh, taking some of the big um, um, integrated assessment models and exploring uh, over a really wide ranges, much wider range of scenarios than you find in the standard IPCC scenario set and finding ones where uh, the policy implications are, are much different than anything you would get in the scenario set. So yeah, no, there, there are definitely um, uh, international examples. Um, in, you know, for a variety of reasons, it's, um, it, 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 I mean, it's harder to do those in a participatory way because it's a much bigger group and um, you get into more, you know, multi, multi-layer issues, but, um, but yes, um, I think this can also be an important tool at the, at the international level. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jesse Jenkins uh, is uh, commenting on the fact uh, that you said there were a few examples of adaptive management and robust planning for climate mitigation strategies. Can you say a little bit more about why you think that is and what can the mitigation community do uh, to change uh, that? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, 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 it may just, I mean, I think it just may be path dependence. I mean, I, th I think the, um, uh, just, you know, where people, uh, where many in this community started, um, you know, and, and that's a somewhat loaded question because Jesse and I have done some workshops where we've actually, uh, in a more quantitative fashion, try to develop some of these adaptive strategies. Um, uh, but um, uh, I, 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 you know, the, 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 the work in Costa Rica, um, it was had the first step, steps towards adaptive strategies, and and I, we've had some grad students uh, do things like uh, looking at um, uh, you know how do you convert natural gas pipelines to hydrogen and um, and and so forth. But um, uh, and 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 clearly the the, the transportation system. But um, I I I think it's mostly just. Um, uh, you know, path dependence, and uh, you know, I think the thing to do is just um, uh, find uh, targets of opportunity in in the mitigation sector and, and places where you know there there are decision decision makers, groups of decision makers, which would find this sort of uh, work powerful, and uh, and show how it can be done. Yeah, clearly, your talk has raised many, many, many more questions than we can answer in our time. We're almost out. But here's a really, really interesting, uh, broad ranging question from Lake Liao, who's asking, how do we best implement this information in talking about talking to people about climate change, especially people who doubt the climate crisis because of this uncertainty? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, uh, I, 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 I think um, the, the, the idea that, um, um, uh, I, 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 that we, uh, you know, that we're, we're trying to manage risk. I mean, I think the risk conversation here is, is, is powerful and useful. Um, and, um, then, um, so I think that's a helpful framing, and but then I think also the um, uh, you know I, 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 much of the resistance to climate change I think is is uh, it often comes through the um, you know people's worry about uh, you know what it means for them and their livelihoods. So I think the ability to look across multiple objectives and look for places where um, there are co-benefits, where that uh, you you know decarbonization strategies generate benefits for for large numbers of people. I mean, that's you know, essentially what the what the Green New Deal is trying to do. So uh, trying to understand um, uh, where where climate uh, provides other benefits for people is, um, uh, is 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 probably a really important way which hopefully these tools could could help illuminate. Well, let me thank you again for your presentation and the audience well, for, for their participation and uh, We'll hopefully uh, reconvene at a future point in time.
Great. Well, thank you so much. Thanks all.